So, Michael, hello there. Is you you you're, you seem even bigger than before I heard that speech. <laughs> you're a giant. Gi we're both giants. We're both giants. Um, we should we should say where we are. I'm I'm talking to you uh, from New York City. Where I'm in the This American Life office. This is my actual office. Michael, where are you? I'm in my actual office in, in which is a, a little redwood cabin in Berkeley, California. Um, and let's just jump in and uh, and let's talk about your new podcast show, Other People's Money. This thing rolls out in February, and in it you go back to your very first book, Liars Poker. You wrote the book in 1989. And just like, okay, just, just like, why are you going back to this book? How'd this happen? Like, what, what are you thinking? It was, I wasn't really thinking in the beginning. What, what happened was I was watching what Pushkin was doing with Malcolm's audiobooks, Malcolm Gladwell's audiobooks. And, and, and in fact, had kind of wondered since I started this whole podcast thing, why my audiobooks were as um, old fashioned. Is it, it hadn't really changed over time. There was no, there was no attempt to do anything but take it and read it. Uh, oh, wait, I think you're talking about how Malcolm did uh, Bomber Mafia, Bomber, where basically but, but, he but, did an audio book where it's a fully produced podcast, basically put out as an audio book. Like also, also his audio, he's, he started to take his audio books and, and make them more podcasty. And, um, and it just seemed to me it's that the, the people, Jacob Weisberg, who runs Pushkin, is a good friend. And we've just been talking about this. Like, where's the opportunity to take one of my books, whatever, the next one I write, and, and we'll, we'll produce it in a different way than the audiobooks have been produced up till now. Mm -hmm. and, but the problem is I have to write a book. And, and meanwhile, uh, I, uh, the audio rights to Liar's Poker became available. And Liar's Poker, we never really, I mean, this shows you how much the world has changed. There was never a proper audiobook of it. I, I read an abridged version that went out in books on tape. You know, there were these cassettes. And, right. and I don't know, I think I read like 60% of it or something, but it was never, no one ever came up to me and said, I heard the book. You know, it just didn't, didn't happen. Right. And, and the book still has this market. I mean, that, that we sell lots of copies every year. And mm -hmm. what, what actually triggered it in the end is my, when my eldest child, Quinn, who's in, uh, she's a junior in college, called and said, uh, two of my friends today said they just came back from Wall Street inter internships and they were made to read Liar's Poker as a like, you know, what's going on on Wall Street? And I thought, well, that's bizarre. I mean, I know what things sells, but I, it's amazing to me that things got this currency. So I never reread it. I never reread the thing. I, I mean, I- Oh, you really, hadn't gone back to it since the late 80s when you wrote like, it. I wrote it. I finished it in whatever, 1988. It 80, public came out in 89. I read a little bits and pieces when I was on book tour. But as a rule, I don't go back and reread the stuff. And I really didn't. I never picked it up and read it. And so I thought, why don't we just do this? And right. I didn't set up. The whole idea of we're doing like a podcast thing alongside of it, that was never the plan. Oh, you're just going to read the audiobook. It's just going to be like, gonna read the audiobook, audiobook. they were going to produce it. They were going to produce right. it in a different way. And you were going to get different sounds. You were going to get right. a feel, a, a, an audio feel with it. Um, right. At the same time, you got the book. And I started reading it. And I had such a violent reaction to it that I started to, th I thought we got to do something with the violent reaction. With the, with just to spell that out. What was the violent reaction? What was happening as you were reading it? From the very first paragraph, I, I read the first paragraph and I said, oh, my God, that first, this doesn't sound exactly like me. It sounds it sounds like <laughs> I know who it sounds like. It sounds like Henry Adams and the education of Henry Adams, because that's what I was reading when I wrote this thing. I mean, you remember, I was what? I was 27. Mm -hmm. I never I mean, I'd written a few magazine pieces, but I would never written anything. And this was like, now I'm going to write a book. And I didn't know how to write a book. I, and, and in fact, I had sold a book to the publisher that was entirely different from the book I wrote. I would sold this kind of history of Wall Street. It wasn't a memoir of my experiences on Wall Street, which mm -hmm. sounds bizarre, I know. But I sat down, I thought the history of Wall Street is boring. But, but like my experiences, that's kind of cool. Maybe and, and, and we should say, like, Liar's Poker basically is the story of how you in your 20s go to work for this firm that's in the middle of this thriving market and, in fact, like exploding market. And you just describe what it's like there. And then you explain kind of the rise and fall of this entire portion of Wall Street. Yes. And the, the sub narrative, maybe actually the narrative, is trying to explain why on earth anyone was paying me hundreds of thousands of dollars to give financial advice to people when I had no idea what I was doing that this, and the idea was like, at the time I thought, 
you know, got to get down, this down on paper when I started to write, because no one's going to believe this happened on Wall Street. Like, this is so crazy. It's not going to, could ever, never get crazier. So it was like, a, a, it was like a message in the bottle to someone who's going to read it a hundred years from now to learn about that crazy period in the 1980s in Wall Street. But when I started to read it for Pushkin, uh, you know, I hadn't looked at it since whatever, 30 something years. I, I thought, oh, it's not quite what I thought it was. It was, I had, I had a, a visceral and not entirely positive reaction to my younger self. <laughs> you were embarrassed. You, I was, I felt it's a bit like if anyone had taken kind of crude home movies of your worst adolescent years and then showed them to the world. It, I thought a little bit like that. There's just stuff here. I know I'm set oversensitive. And I mean this, so, so um, I, that was the first reaction. And then there were a lot of other reactions that led to, Oh, you know, like, there's actually a show in this and there was, and if I had not had constraints, like the constraint was, I didn't have time to do like 20 episodes of a podcast on wall street. We did five episodes because I was working on this new this, podcast. You did five episodes of the podcast, of the, of the podcast attached to coming, coming off the, the, the side of the liars poker book, just thoughts, things I wanted to, one of them with you, like what it's like to go back and, and look at your younger self. Um, Th that so that rip ran right through. It's like, uh, oh, my younger self isn't quite who I thought he was, and in not ways that are good ways. And yeah, okay. uh, and so that was that was like that was the beginning. Uh, but then you know, I've asked you, I've asked you it, like uh, to bring a passage so to this know, interview. Yes, no, you asked me to go look and see. Could I find like a paragraph that um, that that caused me especially to cringe. And the answer was, so I've got something here. I, I was going to read just the first paragraph of the book, but, but it's, it's, um, it wasn't, that wasn't, the problem wasn't just like at the level of the sentence. It was worse than that. I'm going to read the, look, I'll read the first paragraph of the book just because it'll give people an idea of the book. And then I'll tell you what I was thinking after reading the first paragraph for the book. I was a bond salesman on wall street and in London working beside traders at Solomon Brothers put me, I believe, at the epicenter of one of those events that helped to define an age. Traders are masters of the quick killing, and a lot of the killings in the past 10 years or so have been quick, and Solomon Brothers was indisputably the king of traders. What I've tried to do here without, as it were, leaving my seat on the Solomon trading floor, so it was that, at, when I hit, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I have to say the sentences were pretty good. They were no, no, pretty sharp. I hit, as it were, I thought, that. Nah, I don't say as it were. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Keep going, to, yeah. Is to describe and explain the events and the attitudes that characterize the era. The story occasionally tails away from me, but it nonetheless is my story throughout. The money I did not make and the lies I did not tell, I still understand in a personal way because of my position. And I thought, hmm, my position, the lies I didn't tell, the kind of grandiloquent kind of there's you a know, grandness to it. There's a very, yeah, there's, there's a, a big, like, there's a big you're a big, I'm a, I'm a simple man in a, in a, in a, against a big historical backdrop. And that's when I realized, oh, that's not me. I don't use that word. And I don't use that expression. Who is that? Oh yes. Henry Adams. It was Henry Adams telling us about a simple man in a simple era. And I remember that I was grasping for precedent when I started the book, like who's told in a, in a, in there, who's confessed uh, in a way that's been persuasive. And I grabbed that and I grabbed Rousseau's Confessions and there were a couple others and I was reading those. And this is something, I don't know about you, but I mean, I needed a hand, I was insecure. I needed to have my hand on something when I wrote. And now, now I have the opposite. I, I, I can't read things when I'm writing because it messes me up. I just need to be in my own little space. It's oh, really? Like you, you accidentally echo the voice of whatever you're writing? I, if you... I, especially if it's too good. I worry that it's just going to get in the way. Yeah. And, but then I thought, no, I can't be me. Me doesn't work. Like, who's going to read a book by me? Uh, it was, well, I might read a book by Henry Adams or, or Rousseau or one of these other people. So that's, that was the beginning. I had that sense kind of through the first Mm, hundred pages, and and then layered onto that, and you may relate to this, was the sense of some ham-handedness in the actual storytelling. Like, ah, uh, that goes on way too long. That really needs more breath, more air, more oxygen. 
Um, that character, I was, a, I choked off characters. Like that person should have been a big character. Uh, not, not a, a flick of the pen. Uh, it, I should have done more with that person. It was like missed opportunities. I just started seeing things. And yeah. it, it, but I, you could see, I mean, this was where it got really weird. You could see as you read me learning how to write a book, it got better and it got better and it got better. Uh, so I was, I was actually learning on the job in a way no one should ever do. So I have, I have to say, like, like I, I, I relate to this very much. Like when I listen to anything that I did in, in my twenties, it's just, it's just terrible. And often when I'm like talking to student journalists, I'll play them clips. I've brought one here and, and, uh, Is this one and like, and, and, and yeah, and like, and, and, and you've said like how you were imitating like these other writers, what I sound like, I sound like somebody trying to be an NPR reporter and failing. Could we play clip one, please? Some analysts say sorghum is representative of a much larger problem in the world economy. As poor rural areas become linked to national and international markets, investors, farmers, and big companies choose, understandably, to produce the foods that will make the most money in the national and international economy. First of all, the point I'm making, I'm taking so many words to say is just like, people want to make stuff, want to make money. And then like, when you underline every other word at random, like, it's just like, it's just, it's, it's terrible, like at the level of performance, at the level of, just everything about it is, is awful. How do you, does it embarrass you to hear it? Or do you think, or is it, are you charmed by how far you've come? No, it still embarrasses me the same way. Were you embarrassed? No. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I still don't. Feel, I don't feel like that's somebody else. That's somebody recog who I recognize as myself. I, I, I remember being that person for sure. It's a similar problem, though, right? It's a um, you're trying to sound like someone else because you don't trust that sounding like you is going to work. Now, think about what that means for anybody who's like listening to this, who's thinking about trying to create something, who's young, especially, but mm -hmm. not, not, somebody who's not done it before. If Ira Glass doesn't trust his own voice when he's young, who can? Like, you know, it's like your voice is like, it's made you. And I, yeah. I would argue that in a different kind of way, my voice has made me on the page. It's not, totally. as a, but it's a voice. Yeah. It's a voice that's like overwhelms everything. And that you couldn't hear that or you couldn't let that, you couldn't tap that or even think it was there in the beginning is kind of amazing. It's like, but I, like didn't, I don't think I was talented enough. Like, I don't think I had, it's not like there was like some inner me that was like trying to get out. Like, I really just didn't know how to write. I didn't oh, know how to express that. myself in let writing. Me put it let me put it this way. If I had had you in a bar when you, the, the same time you're making that, that sorghum piece. Yeah. And I had asked you to just like, I just, we just having a conversation. I was asking right. about your experiences down in Mes Mexico reporting the sorghum piece. Right. Would I have found you as tedious and monotonal as you were in your actual piece? Or would I have thought, no, actually it's Ira, it's this Ira. Right. You didn't right. get yourself across. Well, it's interesting you say that because like often when we have like a, a, like a young producer who's not experienced at expressing themselves in their writing, like they'll have a draft of a script and, and I or the other producers will just say to them, okay, this isn't working, but just tell me, just tell me what happened. And then they tell us and we just basically type out verbatim what they say when right. they just tell us. And then we're like, okay, that's your script. So, so there's a lesson in this. Uh, one of my favorite writers and one of my mentors when I was starting out was Tom Wolfe. And, and he starts his career. I mean, it's part myth. But not famous story. No, no, no. I know the story. Right? He goes and reports about, about custom car making in, in, Los, in California. It's bigger and more dramatic and everything than he ever imagined. He owes Esquire magazine a piece about it, but he can't get the words out. And the editor says, just write it to me. as a, Just put your notes in a letter to me. We'll have someone else write it. And he writes, Dear Byron. And then he writes it as a letter and they just print the letter. Uh, this, there's something what's going on in Liar's Poker that bothers me in the beginning is that I'm not just writing the letter that I'm, I'm writing. I'm like, I'm trying to do, I'm, I've put something between me and the reader that's wholly unnecessary. And, yeah. uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's hard, it's hard to resist it. You know, you sit down and it's, un, it's a kind of a little bit of an unnatural act writing for an audience. Uh, um, and you kind of got to forget the audience is there to do it well, I find. Um, that you kind of have to, you have to just kind of like tell them, here it is, I'm telling you. 
um, and and so that uh, that I wasn't doing that got really kind of unsettled me when I was reading, and it made me think, oh my god, this thing sold a million copies. It, it worked in spite of that. It tells you how good the material was. Uh, that. Did you, Wait, you mean the basic that? story that you're telling? Yeah, no, you, like what hap- what you witness is crazy. Like the stuff you witness in Liar's Poker, it's it's amazing that you're there to witness it. And you do pick out the characters, who, like characters who are really um, exciting to read about, and uh, and you capture them too. Like we we see that people go through stuff, so that part is there. Before we move on to that, let me, the character, but let me ask you if you had a, ver- a version of this in your career. Where okay yes you're still not Ira Glass you're still not full you're not full throated you you're not being yourself you're there's this thing between you and what you're in your audience and your ability to communicate it um, but did you have, ever have a story that was so good that it didn't matter it kind of didn't it really worked you got it kind of was it did real well it was famous people listened to it in spite of the fact you hadn't actually kind of found your voice. I mean, there were little things at the beginning that I did that I would edit my own self out of, and you would hear a cascade of other people's voices. Like for a long time, um, the most famous thing I did was when I was an All Things Considered producer, I did a story about um, misunderstood song lyrics, which now like lots of people have written about. It. I feel like it's a very old thing, but like, but like we're, we're beep- and basically I had people on tape just saying, oh, I always thought it was there is a bathroom on the right. And then you hear like the, the real lyric from, you know, Credence, you know, just like, um, I, I thought it was like, never leave your pizza burning, but it's never be your beast of burden. <laughs> and like, and you know, you, and just like, and the way that the thing is structured, um, uh, like is very much just following the tape and getting out of the way of the thing. And the basic idea is so simple and just kind of funny. And, uh, I've heard that piece. I love that piece. And you're right. It's not fully you there, though. Right. You're right. But like, but like, there were things like oh, most of my early career, I would do pieces <laughs> where I would edit myself out and have no narration and like, and could, and would just follow the tape. And they did have that. They did have a lot of the feeling of the work I make now. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As an aside, uh, like last month, I got to ask to, to ask Paul McCartney a question for his book tour. He asked a few authors to like submit questions to him. Yeah. And I asked him, did you ever write a song that you thought it was about one thing, but your audience completely misinterpreted and or reinterpreted as something as being something entirely different. And he said, that's never really happened. What happened all the time is people didn't understand the lyrics. And he said like living is easy with nice clothes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes there sometimes i liked what they thought it was better than what i wrote uh, like living is easy with nice clothes <laughs> <laughs> that's very funny um so in the podcast that you're doing you you like you talk to me and others and you talk about people's early work versus their later work is that the that's the idea no no no, no that's not what happens so what happens is while i'm reading this book I'm having a variety of reactions, which become thoughts about what we could do about, which really should be episodes in a, in some, in a podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, w- w- and they weren't all, they weren't all about just the work. They were, it was like, oh, this Wall Street bears a connection to today's Wall Street in some ways and in other ways not. Like yeah. what's changed and what happened, wh- what's sort of relevant? Why is my, why are my daughter's friends being made to read this before they go work for some high frequency trading firm? Like, mm-hmm. I don't, you know, what, what's going on there? So there's one of our episodes is about that. It's sort of like raw, just a, oh, that's interesting. Like, just like what, what is it in this book that it hasn't date hasn't dated? What ha- I mean, things, the things that have dated are kind of remarkable. Like there are no people on wall street anymore. It's like, or no, nobody talks to each other. They're like, you know, in cubicles, te- it's all tech. It's all the tra- everything. There's not a trade. There's not a trading floor. There's nothing like there. There's nothing uh, where people shouting and throwing phones and no, nobody shouts. Yeah. Where it does, uh. it basically doesn't exist. Um, there are people in the jobs, but they're extensions of machines, and it's all very quiet and docile and sterile. And so this whole, you know, the idea of like a bunch of guys shoving Mexican food in their, in their mouths with one hand while they're cheering a stripper on the trading floor with the other and making trades into 
uh, you know, a hoot and holler with the, with the that that's just gone. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, that's that's changed, but a lot hasn't changed. And in fact, in fact, you can sort of see where I didn't appreciate this at the time that there were like these mega trends that were that were kicking into gear. It would kind of start. It's like tracking the Mississippi to its source. Uh, they were happening right there, right around me. To, you know, the author is oblivious to it. But in fact, the world will detect that this was not this was a, this was a moment in financial history. So this all getting very so very complicated that we don't understand you know, Wall Street anymore because it's gotten so it has gotten so intellectual. The people, right. the people on Solomon Brothers trading floor, when I arrived, some of them didn't have high school diplomas and nobody went, you know, the whole thing about going to Harvard and Yale, that was just happening. Uh, that Wall Street went, it went from taking, it, it actually kind of being a machine that could take people from all backgrounds and turn them into, you know, rich traders or successful, uh, that, that, that mm -hmm. changed. Now, now it's sort of like, Wall Street recruits from the physics department, at MIT. And that was just starting then. And you could hmm. see it starting and you could see the culture changing. So, so that you could also see um, the sort of the other people's money thing, that the Wall Street I walk into is a Wall Street that still has somewhere in the back of its brain, it's, it's our money, it's partner's money. Now, Solomon Brothers had just ceased to be a partnership, become a corporation. So it, huh. it, but all the other ones, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, they were still partnerships. So that like if they blew up, if they made some big bets on subprime mortgages or whatever that went bad, you know, the partners lost their houses. So they didn't do that kind of thing. It was sort of like, oh, this is it's it was the the the, the risk taking environment was changing. And that's sort of present in the book. And this other business, because it's rapid tech change is like the other thing It's like rapid technological change is just starting to happen. And there's something weird socially, sociologically that happens and there, when, when tech is changing all the time, um, as it still is on Wall Street. Someone made this point back in the dot-com bubble that when, when the internet went boom, it had this social effect to empower kids, young, really young people. Yeah. It was, they say, likened it to like what happens in immigrant families. That family moves from Mexico to the United States. Yeah. Within a year, the parents are still struggling to understand English and the kids are running circles around. That, that it's like we, everybody becomes an immigrant family in a, in a really rapid tech cha change environment. And, uh, and that was happening there. So, and it's, ha it's still happening. Young people get ahead very quickly on Wall Street. That was just starting when I started. So that all of a sudden, you know, 24-year-old me understands, really understands really critical, complicated stuff that we're doing that, I, that our CEO really doesn't understand. Mm -hmm. And I, I just have to try to explain it to him and he doesn't get it. You know, that happens in the book, that kind of stuff. So that, all that yeah. is kind of like, huh, oh, we moved in the world where, into a world where there no, there's no adult supervision. It's like the kids are in charge. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, that's I, cool. that, so, so that all was, that's in the series. All that's in one show. Uh, so that's yeah. one of the, yeah. Oh, sorry, I went on. A little, I went on a little bit there. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, but so the the other thing I really wanted to do when I was reading it was there are all these anonymous characters. I mean, I actually would call people and say, "Hey, you're in my book. What do you want? To, I, I won't use your name because it'll ruin your career. But what do you What do you want to be called?" And and they would give me there. Like one guy said, "I want to be Dash Riprock." Why he was he had a reason I didn't know why but I just okay, that's I'll a really you, good name I'll call you Dash Riprock there was the human piranha there was like oh, also uh, yeah right? so I thought I wonder where these people are so I I I we have the episode where we go back and we go talk to all these people who were in my book who and 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 they reveal who they are uh, wow. and, and talk about their careers so it's just it was just like as you're reading it you start thinking hmm there's stuff I want to know more about uh wh why that's not? nice. Why not do this as a podcast series? And one of the things was, I wonder if other people feel the way I feel when they go back and look at their early stuff. And I happened to bump into you while we were doing yeah. it. And I, he's yeah. perfect. <laughs> so we do an episode with you. So, so one of the things that that I thought it would be interesting to talk to you about in this in this context is like we're talking to a bunch of people who make podcasts, and and it's it's been very interesting to me that like you and Malcolm Gladwell who figured out a way to do narrative journalism in magazine length and book length on the page that you both got kind of fascinated 
with doing it as audio and then really got very serious about it, like both of you. And and like, I'm wondering like, okay, so you've been doing podcasting now for a couple of years and like you and I would be like, when you were on This American Life, generally we would just either have you read your own magazine pieces in the early days of the show. Maybe we'll play one of those before we go. Uh, but And then like there was one where I produced you, which was really fun for me, where I basically served as your producer and we went out and did a story. That was a and, gas. And, yeah. And, but I feel like, but I feel like now, like you've really been a podcaster for a few years now. And I'm wondering like, are there things that you've come to understand about making a story as audio now that you didn't understand back when you started? Like, like, are there things that you've really learned Something. about it? Yes, uh, I think. I mean, it's, but this is like, this is like me trying to explain how paint works to Rubens. I mean, this is crazy. No, no, uh, but, but you know but, what I mean. But, like, but I'm right. curious, like, what's right. like... So I'll tell you what, I'm the, I'm the newcomer to your world. Yeah. I'll, tell you my, I'll tell you my take on it. So first place, just like the audiobook of Liars Poker, it was kind of, I kind of walked into it sideways. I wasn't, uh, it was, um, the, the reason I started against the rules in the beginning was first Jacob Weisberg said, it's easy, you don't have to do much work. That was a total lie. Oh my uh, God. I know, it was a total <laughs> lie. Uh, and um, so- but I will say like, it, it totally fucks me up. The fact that like every person who I admire has their own goddamn podcast. The fact that like, Remnick would have his like is, is like doing a podcast in addition to like editing the New Yorker no, and yeah, like so, Obama so, like so, has got some spare time so he does a fucking <laughs> podcast like like why do they have to do their job and then my job also but okay keep going yeah you sound like John Hamm in the new a Apple commercial it, is that true Apple TV why is everybody on here <laughs> <laughs> why is everybody on here where am I uh, it it's for me I needed palate cleansers between books I have this view that after a book, the last thing I should do is write another book, that I should pretend at least that I'm never going to write another book, that I've never written a book. That way it's new again. And I only do it if the book, if the idea for the book is so good, I have to do it. I don't mm. do it because I'm supposed to write another book again. because I'm So I have to have something but, else to do. So wait, so then for, so, so, and then for generally, like how many years are there before you're like, come on to the next book? Is it like six months? Is it a year? It varies. Uh, yeah. I mean, really varies. Uh -huh. um, I'd say in the last 15 years, it's been a year, but, okay. um, but in any case, and what, what I used to do as palate cleansers, or I don't know, strength and conditioning in the off season, think of it that, as that way. Was yeah. I'd, write, I'd write film scripts uh, and I get paid to do it. I'm, a, I'm like the world's greatest failure as a screenwriter. I've been paid over and over and over to, get, to write things that have never been on the air. And they've right. gotten very close, but never happened. So the things that are movies of your books, you didn't write any of those screenplays oh, at any point. I no. also have maybe a, the quixotic view that I'm the worst person to adapt one of my books because to do it, it really is a different thing. It's a different form. Yeah. I mean, it's basically a short story, a, a screenplay. It's really compressed. You have to yeah. break all the stuff you do. You have to sort of like go argue against all the decisions, you creative decisions you made. And I don't know. I just don't That's want to do so it. interesting. Yeah, I totally see that. Yeah, because it's so short. Yeah, it's short, and you're, so you're leaving a lot on the floor. And I just think I'm my judgment will be poor in it in with my own work. So yeah. I say to them, I say, no, no, you do it. I don't do it. But um, so so I I had this kind of like strength and conditioning program. It would be film scripts or mag. It's a little magazine pieces or columns, or whatever it was. But it was different right. from long long enough. And and so I thought, oh well, maybe the podcast will a podcast. It'll at least get made. You know, I, and it, that will be that will be a better strength and conditioning program. Instead of, you know, I, I'm stopping my season as a baseball player, and instead of instead of running, I'm going to swim in the off season. And so, and it, and it turned out, so and it wasn't just oh, not writing books. The film script writing film scripts really disciplining. Like I really do think it's strengthening and conditioning. It really forces you to think differently about a story and to visualize. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, no, I understand that. Like, you really have to make very tight choices. Like, there's a precision to it that, like, yeah, like, I've, like I've, I've worked on it. I, like, I've made a bunch of films, too. Yeah. And you have to have a sense of what the audience is seeing, right? Mm -hmm. And you don't, what you don't necessarily do when you're writing a book, but you should yeah. think about that. You should think about that because it's part of what's being activated in their brain. Uh, well, with this, so all of a sudden, it's this. It's the ear. 
like, all right, you're writing for the ear. And I didn't know, you know, I, everything I knew about what I was doing, I learned from you in our one, you know, the one time I did it with you, or I, we, right. did, a, we did a few, we did a few things, but I learned yeah. a lot working with you, but that was, that was it. I don't have any experience of this. And I found first some things surprised me. One was how, how the medium rewards emotion much more so than print. It is such an emotional medium that, that any time you have, it's all the same, you know, funny and sad is the same thing. It's two sides of the same coin. It's an emotional yeah. state versus a non-emotional state. Yeah. You get is such payoff with the podcast in having people in an emotional state. Yeah. Because in the book, books, you really can get, they live, people can live very happily in a cooler state. And you can get across in their advantages. You can get across really complicated stuff in a book in a way that's harder to do in a podcast. Harder to explain a collateralized debt obligation in a podcast. Can be done, but I've done it. We've done it. But yeah, it's it's, it's hard. It's hard. It's, hard, it's, hard. it's harder. Um, but to get people to laugh and cry, easier. And um, and that you should be pay really attention to the, mo- the emotional content of the of the material. But also, so also the, how these people, how people sound, you know, you know, we, we <laughs> you are saying of, the most basic things here. And it's really funny to hear you say it. But I, but know, yes. I know maybe this sounds stupid to you, but it's no, it's, it doesn't. It's like, it's, it's all so important. Like, but like for me, like one of the things that's so different in writing a, a, an article, writing for print is that you're not structuring around the quotes. Whereas when you're broadcasting both radio and TV in doing narrative documentaries, you're constantly having to jump from quote to quote to quote and you structure around the quotes. And I wonder if like that has been a thing I that you know. Do- you don't do that. <laughs> I, don't do that. I, don't, I mean, I don't do that. No, I tell a story. I tell a story and I remember something that, that I've never structured around the quotes. I just the, the in print, well, in the podcast, don't you? I mean, it's, if you looked at the script, of course, you're seeing narration, quote, narration, quote, whatever. Yeah. But it isn't laid out like that. I don't think of it that way. I think of I'm telling a story in there. Uh, what do we have in here that people said that I can that's going to be that goes here? But I don't start with like the quote. You don't. Okay. Uh, no. Wow. Um, um. So that it isn't, and it isn't. Um. No. I think about the. I do think a lot about the the what emotions are getting across and how people are going to feel listening to it. Uh, so that's that, that, um, mm-hmm. but describing people. So, so this, you probably disagree with this, but, um, like in print, you got to, I, when I introduce a new character in a book, that's going to be a big character. I, I need to make that person, bring that person a lot alive to the yeah. life for the reader. They don't have anything, but with this, you have their voice. And the voice sometimes you sometimes can step on your own toes by trying to tell the audience, you know, they look like this or they are like this. The voice just does it can do a, an all yeah. for you. Yeah. I mean, I I mean, I, I give you examples, but that it, nobody's heard it. So because for the next season, I was just thinking about this. I've got these characters. I don't need to tell them anything about this person because the voice just just does it. Yeah. Uh, and so that, that but the thing I wonder if you're going to disagree with and I, I fight my producers about this a little bit. Um, that there's this thing about having scenes, you know, here I am outside the, the NBA replay center in Secaucus, New Jersey, and right. walking down and I'm walking in, knock, knock, knock. Hi, Michael. Welcome to the NBA replay center. That, that is, I find that stuff awful. I'm, I'm leaving that, that kind of these generated, oh, here we are in there or in this, and it's all this natural sound. I found to my taste it's contri- it's kind of contrived and mm-hmm. yeah occasionally you have some you're wandering around in a natural that's fine but i've i've kind of completely moved away from that that kind of thing I have to say, like, 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 I see the utility of those kinds of things because it's visual, right? You put the people, you put the audience in a visual space; they can see you in the space. But we don't do those very much on This American Life because we also find them kind of corny, and we also find corny the thing that so many podcasts do, that like Radio Lab did first, and then the Daily does almost every episode, where they begin the whole thing with the t- the interviewer and the interviewee going like, "Is this thing on? Can you hear me? Can you hear me?" Like, like you know, and, like that thing. Like, wait, do like. G- g- you know, did, were they, were they, were you hear them like establish the connection, which I was just like, oh my God, like, I understand why you do it. It makes them into human beings. It brings them on, on the stage as characters, but oh my God, what a cliche, yeah, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, and like, no, like we, we, like you, like, like we very much are moving the, the story forward. We're like, we're, we're, we're putting things out 
where we're thinking like, what's the beat of the story? What has to happen first and second and third? And so we rarely do that kind of like, oh, we're standing here and whatever. But we do look for scenes. For us, a good scene is where people are interacting and something unpredictable is happening between them. Like we don't that, do the other thing. Unpredictable, yes. yeah. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. What's something that, that you are better at as a podcaster now than you were two years ago when you started? Um, much better, much better at anticipating um, the audience's tedium. That much better at realizing how the where the attention span is when you're listening mm -hmm. to something. That um, I, I so that my first drafts are they're just much less needs to be cut out of it. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I then I I over I would in the beginning I just I I would I gave the the listener more credit than he or she deserved what they put up with. And um, so, so much more kind of ruthlessly efficient in the, in, in laying the thing out and writing about it. Um, also, uh, I mean, it, it's a, it's a funny medium. It, this is, so this sounds like it's going to sound like almost like um, contradictory. But on the one hand, sometimes I think when I'm writing, the very best story is really streamlined, really tight, a couple, of, a really simple structure. Mm -hmm. And yes, that's true. It really is true. It's true in anything, but it's true, especially in this. It's like that you just, you're making it easier on a listener when it's a really simple structure. But it really is a medium that tolerates endless digression. And jumping from one thing to the other without any warning, you can really do do stuff with with when you're talking to someone. It's very hard, harder to do on the page. And I've gotten so I've got I think I've gotten better at knowing at both at the streamlining and in like using the aggressive powers of the thing. Um, hmm. But I don't. I'm gonna under no illusion that like I've learned what I need to know. I'm still learning. I mean, I'm we, I'm in the middle of the third season now. And I'm still learning and it's totally fun. Let me ask you that question. Like, what are you better at? Are you still getting better or is it all kind of oh home? There's nothing else to learn. It's more like I go through little like fads in my own work of like what I'm making or how I'm making it. Um, like, Like lately, I've been really enjoying the super simple do one interview, like little one interview story. Um, you know, where you just where like the the easiest kind of story to make. You know, where where interview somebody who tells you a story which has a plot and ask them a bunch of questions that lead to some thought or feeling or something about it, and then just like could just cut it together in like the cleanest, nicest way. Um, at the end of the year, I was doing a thing in the opens of our shows where each opening, I was just experimenting in the form of the opens. So instead of just telling one anecdote, I would tell two or three and jump from place to place just because it was uh, amusing to do. Um, yeah, like I don't, like we're turning out so much product. Do you know what I mean? Like, like when you're turning out like 26 or 30 hours of stuff and you're editing and like, and I'm the final editor on most of it. You really are Rubens. You have this big studio and you've got all these other people painting the putty. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so like, but the thing, like, I just want to talk back to it. Like one of the things that, and it's funny, like I, yeah. What am I getting better at? I've gotten better as an interviewer, uh, like uh, over the years for sure. Um, and uh, like it used to be, I would have to edit out a lot of my own questions because I could just hear myself searching and fumbling in a way that I don't quite as much now, but that took forever. Huh. Um, th you... there's a, th there's, there's a thing that you were saying about like, that you can digress more. I feel like I have to say, like, I feel like in the same way that learning the pacing of a podcast is a thing you have to kind of like learn by doing. I also think learning how much you can digress. And then honestly, like some of the most bitter fights we get into as, as editors on our show are, can you digress from the story for this long or can you go this much more? And I remember like there was a story that I did about uh, this guy, Gary Goleman. And, uh, and he's basically telling this story about how he was a really big kid in high school. And so he was encouraged to play football, but he didn't want to play football. He didn't want to hit anybody. He didn't like sports or he liked sports, but he didn't like that. 
you know, and, um, and but he starts playing football and there comes a point where it just is going terribly for him. And then he has this digression where he talks about how he would sleep with his blankie. He's away at college and he would sleep with his blankie. And he mentioned in passing that he still sleeps with it. And then I was just like, wait, what? Like, you're how old? And he's like a 37, 47 year old man. I was like, wait. And then I was just like, we head down a long road that for me was the essence of like, why even do a radio show if you can't pause on this thing? You have this functional grown man, a successful comedian, like really super smart guy who still sleeps with his blankie yeah. at night. And then like among my staff, there was such division about like, you're leaving the story. What does this have to do with anything? And I just feel like if we can't spend like a good two minutes on this blankie thing, like why, why are we even doing right? Like what, what's, what's the fun of, what's the fun of it? You know what right. I mean? And like, but like, honestly, it really was one of those arguments that you get into editorially where like they're on one side and I'm on the other and like some people are my side and there's no, oh, we can do it halfway. You either do it or you don't do it. You know, you two things. I did two thoughts of what you just said. One is, um, a like a stuffed bunny would have been totally acceptable, but a blankie. I mean, really. But no. <laughs> one, is, one is one is the there's a part of the, the the audio making process is much more. It's collaborative and in, more interactive than 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 writing a book. Uh, yeah, I have editors at the publishing house, but they aren't. They don't. We don't do the any version of like a table read. And, and I've, it's taken me forever to get used to the idea of eight people sitting around a table listening to my rough draft and, and thinking of all the bad things they can say about it. It's very unpleasant, right? It's very unpleasant. And I did it with you all in that office, like right where you are. Yeah. And it was one of the most unpleasant experiences I've had <laughs> because I thought, I mean, really, it was a really, that ended up being a really good piece. I'm sorry. That was, what yeah, I, yeah. 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 And it was like, just, I was really good. And yeah. the material was really good. This isn't bragging. It's just like we had great. But, you know, I agree. The underlying story just was inherently good. Really you know, all we had to do was get out of the way of the quality of the thing we were trying to document and we would be fine. But when you're sitting around a table with a bunch of producers, they don't say, oh, wow, that's interesting. Or, wow, I love that part. Or, oh, that's so funny. Or I, I was, I was entertained. They go right to what bothers them. And so you, I have to, had to get used to the negativity uh, and just and, and learn how to kind of, and when people, and it's interesting, when you, I think this is just a general rule for people when you're taking editorial advice of any sort. When people are hearing something for the first time that you've worked very hard and you figured out, th thought you figured out the best way to tell it, but maybe you haven't. Usually, very often when they have a problem, they're probably kind of right. That there's a pro there's some problem, <laughs> like there is yeah. a problem, but they they may not have actually identified the yes. problem, or, or like the, or the right or the right solution, or the right solution that they're just signaling to you. Uh, you know, watch, you know, a third of the way in, I didn't like that, and I don't know why they don't really know why they didn't like it. Uh, they, yeah, and so learning how to like interpret. That room full of purse people has been that has been an experience for me. It's like I just put when I'm we're doing it, I just put a note. I say, got figure out what happened there. They don't know what happened there, but they think they know what happened there, but that's not what happened there. And yeah. um, it's so every now and then they're right. They're, it's not always wrong. But, mainly, but but the main thing is to when you to hear criticism uh, in a more in a little bit vaguer way than it's usually delivered. It's like there's just something not quite working here, is what you should hear. Not this character doesn't work because X, Y, or Z. Um, oh, I see. I, I, I like people to be more oh, like, no, my, no, like no, no, we, I, my team, we all work with each other so much. I feel like there's such a shorthand to it where somebody would be like, you know, like this part gets a little slow. This goes, this goes, this quote goes on for two sentences too long. You know, like this character is boring. Kill this character. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I encourage, I encourage precise criticism. It's just, I, you got to hear it for what it is, which is there's just a problem here. Uh, and that may, the, the actual words in the criticism may not be what the problem. Yeah. Is. Yeah. True, true, uh, true. So Do people go to the trouble uh, in your edits to, to start with praise? Because, because we as a staff, we know that like, oh, at least say a, a thing or two at the beginning that's praise. And then the producer, we're also editing each other. We're like, yeah, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Okay, just get to it. You know, like. <laughs> yeah, say, we should just say praise. And here, yeah. So uh, <laughs> the answer to that is not really. Uh, not really. Uh, it, they really. Pushkin, go, man. They push it's like rough. A, 
It takes it the, the hard Russian winters. It's the mean streets <laughs> of Pushkin, man. It, it, yeah, so I've had to just take me a little while to get used to that. Um, yeah, was something else that you that I was going to say is probably not worth saying because I forgot what it is. Um, <laughs> but, but, but it's, All right, okay, okay. All right, so we have questions from the people who are listening. Let me just look at these. Uh, if you go into the chat, Michael, in the Zoom, I think you'll see them too because if there's one that you feel excited to answer, um, uh, somebody <laughs> writes. Get, yes, here it is. It says, Michael, do you see this in the chat? All right. That's, <laughs> that's all I got. So you, that's, that's all you got. Oh, people are sending them directly to me. Okay. So okay. here we go. Um, is there a particular story in each of your careers that you think of as a hinge point, the moment when something clicked and as Michael put it, you discovered your voice. Do you have that, Michael? You go first. I mean, I did, I did have one story and it's funny. I, I talk about it sometimes and play it sometimes with people. And it's a, it's about the, uh, the 75th anniversary of the Oreo cookie that when I wrote it, I thought, oh, at last I know what I'm doing. But now when I listen to it, I think, oh, you didn't know what you were doing. <laughs> um, so there was, there was that like, and so, and then there've been other stories along the way where I've thought like, oh, wait, 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 th that was it. I finally, like, that's it, that one. Like there's a story that I did about a, a man who picks up dead animals on the street where the way the tape works, it's really a series of very quick scenes and very simple writing. And it's really funny. Like the, the Oreo story has one funny moment. And I remember thinking that's the first time I've ever been able to get a funny moment into like a, a piece of reporting I was doing. And, and that was a real turning point for me. Um, I've, I can think of two after, what Liar's Poker is this flukish launch to a career. I sit down not knowing what I'm doing, finish not really knowing what I'm doing, sell a gazillion books and I'm kind of on my way. Um, and that, so that is obviously like the, maybe the biggest moment of my career, but, but I can, I have, there are a couple of moments where I thought, I'm hitting a new note. And um, the one that comes to mind was a night I spent almost all night at a desk in the New Republic offices. I was covering the presidential campaign in 1996 and quickly decided that the campaign was too boring to be ju to justify any space in the New Republic. At least the main Bob Dole and Bill Clinton were. And it was the, the outcome was predetermined. It was like it was a, it was a horrible story of a campaign. But there are these wonderful characters who are running for president who weren't getting very much attention. And, um, and that these characters, you know, at any given time, it's amazing how many people are running for president. You think you know all of them? There are hundreds yeah. of people. People you know are secretly running for president. Uh, but, and that, but I had this raft of characters in the Republican primary who were wonderful characters. Um, and two things happened in that while I was on the road covering that. One was like bold decision to make Maury Taylor the main character of New the New Republic's campaign coverage. And when I started writing him, he just sang. And I realized, and they're going to let me, and, and I, re I realized that it just sang on the page and they're going to let me do it. So it was like, I'm off the leash. I was off the leash in just a way I'd never quite been before, like not <laughs> doing what I was supposed to do. And it was working. But the moment yeah. I remember was, Maury Taylor was, I should say, like a businessman of some sort of tire company. He and then he of Titan Tire and Wheel. Yeah, yeah. And then he was running for president, not doing very well. OK, sorry. Keep going with your story. Seven million dollars getting 7000 votes in Iowa and New Hampshire. However, mm -hmm. everyone in both those states loved him more than any politician they'd ever met because he'd roll into their town with kegs of beer and Bruce Springsteen blaring from his RV and throw a party. And, yeah. and his and his political views were actually probably more in line with most Americans than any of the other candidates. Anyway. Um, uh, but, but that wasn't, it wasn't Maury Taylor. It was, it was it, when the primary was over and the general had between the primary and the general it, talk about sleepy time, there was really nothing to do. And so I just started saying, I just started following a, the characters who interested me, even if it wasn't exactly related to the campaign and John McCain was one of those characters. He was a surrogate for Bob Dole, so I had an excuse to hang with him. Mm -hmm. And John McCain at that moment was um, in, in politically not in a great place. He, was the, he, was a, he had been scandalized in the savings and loan scandal. People weren't paying much attention to him. He, it looked like he was kind of dead in the water. And I got to say, I fell in love with the guy. I thought he was just a, it was a riveting character at the time. And I wrote this thing. It was a kind of two-hander. Uh, uh, a, re a relationship between John McCain and a Vietnam War protester 
who named David Ifshin, who had actually um, gone to Hanoi and piped uh, anti-American propaganda into John McCain's cell when John McCain was a, was a prisoner of war in prisoner Vietnam, of war being yeah. tortured for five years. Yeah, as you say, so 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 for anybody who doesn't know much about John McCain, right? He was a prisoner of war in Vietnam, and yeah, keep going. And, and senator from Arizona, and they had this really moving post-war relationship where they reconciled, and John McCain stood up on the Senate floor to to speak on behalf of the bravery of this man, this other man. And this man, David Ifshin, was dying of cancer when, when uh, I stumbled into this story. And I wrote it in a night and it came out and I thought, I was, I remember, I remember a tear, I tear, I got very emotional about the story, but it was told in a very controlled way. But when people read it, it just exploded in their brains. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to, I may get grief for claiming this, but I'm going to say it anyway. It was remarkable the effect it had on John, John McCain's career. Turn that story had the most incredible effect. It's maybe the you know in the top three or four most influential things I've ever written, and it was just a little piece, but it was sort of. I remember this piece though, and I have to say I've never forgotten it. Whenever I would see him in the years and years after when he ran for president, just everything that happened, his fights with Trump, that story that you tell about him and Ifshin is so beautiful. And I just want to say to people. Listening, you could probably Google this, Michael Lewis, John McCain. There aren't going to be that many stories like that. And you can read it, and it's short, and it's really, really memorable. And, yeah. and, and, and I think the thing it did for me, sort of as kind of like turning point, was our, here I'm with a bunch of smarty pants at the New Republic. Everybody knows more about politics than I do. I don't know anything. You know, I'm just like, I'm, I'm stumbling around doing reportage. And I just wrote, I wrote something that meant a lot to me in this space. It was a little on the side of the conversation. It wasn't in the middle of any conversation. Mm -hmm. It has this explosive effect. And it kind of taught me, like, it doesn't much matter what everybody's talking about. Figure out what you care about. And, and when you find something you really care about and you put it and you, you, it, there's, there's, you if you can bottle it, it's incredibly powerful. And no matter what the subject Right. So it was, yeah. you know, I was off turf in a funny way and um, off my turf. And, and that, that was a, I think it was a big moment for me. Um, I, yeah, I, see I, I sort of shove everybody in a direction in a really surprising way with a little piece of writing because, because it's a, the story is so powerful. Which okay. later you end up doing. And I have to say this, this corresponds to something that we often say, like when I'm talking to young uh, audio journalists, is like, and they say like, what's, what's your advice? My advice is like, run at the thing that is most interesting to you. Find the thing that's most compelling to you. There's all these dutiful things that we think we should be making stories about, but just like run at the thing that, 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 that like is just magnetic to you. Yeah, and yeah. That's, that's where your best work will be. Uh, we only have time, I think for one other, sorry, did you want to say? No, no, I'll shut up. Um, uh, I guess, uh, we've got a bunch of questions here. Um, one of the people writes, um, my old documentary teacher used the term cinematic language. Is there anything when adapting from print to audio that simply cannot be turned into a radio story? That's a really good question. Yeah, um, I thought so too. It's a really good question. I, I can think of things that would work less well as radio stories. Um, it... it um, and you got the constraint that you need the tape. So I, when I think about, oh, could you do Moneyball as a radio story? Well, yeah, but you'd have to have, I'd have to be walking around and get all that stuff on tape. There's certain, there are things that are really hard to get on tape. And I could never have gotten Liar's Poker on tape. You know, they, I, was, right. I, I was already- Being like a spy. <laughs> I was a spy. That's right. That's exactly right. Um, but so the most really, recent book, The Premonition, like so much of it is just built out of interviews, right? Like, couldn't you have just done those interviews on tape? Could that have worked on tape? So we took the first chapter. And I, when I realized that the first chapter was just Charity Dean, my main character, and me, and the, those were the only two voices. And I had her perform her quotes, her lines. What? For yeah, the audio book? For, for, we did it for, um, it was kind of like an audio excerpt that Pushkin put out. Wow, and, wait, and does it, how's, how does she perform? Can she perform herself in a credible I, way? I just had her read it, you know, I, I, and, you know, we coached her a little bit, but it was more like, don't, don't perform, just say it the way you would say it. So when she says, uh, 
the last line in the, in the chapter is something like men like that always underestimate me. They think my spirit animal is a bunny, but it's a fucking dragon. And, and I remember exactly what she, how she sounded. She was furious when she said it. And I, you know, I, I wanted her to sound the way she sounded when she said it. So she, we got her into that headspace and she did it. Um, and it really worked. It may, and it, it worked so well that I think, yeah, could, this could totally have been done as a, and you know, I, and I think there's a reason why. Um, it is the most character driven of all the books I've written. And that's saying something. I went yeah. in saying, I'm going to find the characters and I'm going to worry about what the story is later. And, um, and audio really does a w- reward character. And, and it's so I, the characters would have really pulled you through an audio version. Um, mm-hmm. They're very distinctive voices, actually, actual voices. So that could, could have been great. So something, some of these, there are things that I'm trying to think what wouldn't, what wouldn't work. What works less well is like the long parts of the big short where I'm trying to explain, well, you did it. I'm trying to explain how the, what's going on in this very complicated financial sector. Yeah, yeah. I, would, I just wouldn't want to do that with audio. There's I, also I, certain things in the premonition where you're explaining the kind of interactions that everybody's having with the CDC, that if they were, if it was a podcast, it would just be like long, long stretches of narration. Like a lot goes down, but it's not a lot that goes down with quotes. Right. And and so people could, I mean, if you had the right interviewees, they could just tell you the stories. And That's clearly true. somebody did tell you the stories, right? Yes. But like to make the tape land in the right way, it's funny, like like the premonition is so, it, like it, it's like, it's just dense with one anecdote after another, after another. Like even interview, in, even when you're introducing charity, there's like seven amazing anecdotes that you can tell just to like establish her character before before the plot even starts. Before That's we're right. even like, yeah. I felt that I had to because no one knows who she is. Yeah. It was the problem. It was, um, you know, you do this. Everybody has this problem. William Goldman has this great thing in Adventures in the Screen Trade about how he, when he wrote Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, he had this problem uh, that nobody had ever heard of Robert Redford and, uh, and, he, and put Paul Newman's playing it with him. And how do you establish like this character? And he had to, did he had to set it, he had to <laughs> generate an incredible anecdote right at the beginning of that where it's, it's Robert Redford, not Paul Newman, who's the star just to get the audience's mind around the, who this character was. Oh, wow. And, uh, and so Charity Dean presented that problem. In addition, the stories are unbelievable. So you don't, you kind of, it's hard to resist them, but I needed to yeah. say this. This is a very badass public health officer. Whatever you think a public health officer is, th- you don't know. This is, here, here's a badass public health officer. And I just needed, so I needed to do that so people would follow her as a main character in a book. Yeah. Um, but, Can I say one thing, it, like in response to the person's question? Like, like I've I've over the years, like really adapted a lot of work and tried to adapt a lot of work from print into audio. And certain things, like I and my producer, co-producers, we will run at and and we fail. And generally, like there's just a certain pace that you need events to happen in uh, in an audio story, and and uh, and. And you really have to be mindful of pacing. And like, there are certain writers who are wonderful writers who who a bunch of us on staff really love, who we've tried to like edit down their work and for radio, and it just doesn't work. You also, I find like, you, you can't have something that's too contemplative for too long because read out loud, you just don't stay with it. You actually do need forward motion, which I guess I'm saying the same thing twice. The other thing is you need the language to be more spoken. If somebody's language isn't, conversational enough it can sound it can just be it can just be hard it can just be harder to listen to like there's just some basic building blocks and and then like one of the things like when i was when i was first like i get npr i first started putting david sedaris onto the radio when i was at npr and i basically had heard him read in clubs he wasn't a published writer and uh and so he would read in these little clubs in chicago um these short stories and excerpts from his diaries and stuff and it was heard some fake diaries. And um, and from the first time I heard him read, I remember where I was at a club called Lower Links on Clark Street down in the basement. I was like, oh, that guy would be perfect for the radio because this stuff is really funny. It's really surprising. And also like every 45 seconds or a minute and a quarter, the anecdote would end or he would have some new thought. 
And the way that radio, public radio is paced, the unit of a new thought is 45 seconds. <laughs> Like and 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 if you think about it, like if you listen to All Things Considered, a morning edition, just like even on the newscast, in the newscast when they throw to a reporter for one of the little short, like the, the, basically to write like a couple of sentences of script and then a piece of tape from somebody, a couple of sentences of script come out to do a little news spot. It's 40, 45 seconds, thirty five, and like and weirdly when at the top of our show, at the top of This American Life, we. I consciously write so that the ideas happen. So you get something comes to completion every 45 seconds or a minute. And then I slow you down. Like basically like then the quotes can start to get longer and longer. But for the first two or three minutes, because we're on a public radio station, I make it as quick as the public radio station goes. And 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 so so Sidaris from the very beginning, like he naturally was writing in anecdotes that that landed every like 45 seconds to minute to minute and a quarter. And I was like, I, like really, like I didn't ask him to read anything on the radio for two or three years. But from the very first time I heard him, I was like, oh, that moves at radio speed. I wonder if he stumbled upon some universal truth, like so the rule of three or, or the law of seven. It, it, <laughs> like there's something that maybe human beings actually process ideas for about 45 seconds and then they, then they tune out. Uh, I, I, I wonder if radio knows something. And maybe, maybe, uh, maybe. Um, okay, so uh, why don't we take, so Michael, we can take another question. We can play the clip of you on This American Life from the I want to hear 90s. that. I, you know, that, that's, that's like the very beginning of your show, right? I mean, it's like the, mm -hmm. one of the first few episodes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is, the, so let's, let's play that. Um, this is me and then <laughs> me introducing Michael um, from 1996. So uh, surely this is something that most people have not heard lately. Um, and uh, honestly, our audience was so small, very few people heard at the time. Um, so let's play clip number four, please. Act three, Campaign Diaries. Throughout this year, we've been bringing you the reportage of Michael Lewis. He's publishing his campaign diaries in The New Republic. Regular listeners to our program or regular readers of his know that at some point, during this election year, Michael Lewis became mesmerized with a presidential candidate by the name of Maury Taylor. Maury Taylor ran in the Republican primaries. He shows up in, in this installment you're about to hear, and he goes by the nickname The Grizz. Soon enough, I find the parking lot. It lies directly behind a small cluster of protesters, a half mile or so from the convention center. It consists of maybe four acres of concrete, at the back of which is a stage. Over the stage is an American flag, and in front of the flag is a huge banner. It reads, Titan, America's newest tire company. That's Maury's company. On the stage are five large black men playing loud instruments, each of whom wears a bandana that says, The Grizz. That's Maury. At the front of the stage, with a cigar jutting straight out from his mouth, gyrating slightly to the funk, is Maury. When I decided to make this guy the main character of the New Republic's coverage, there was a moment. There was a moment. And the moment was in a, the high school in Ames, Iowa. And I was just like seeing who he was. You know, who is this guy? He says, come along. I'm going to go talk to the high school. So he rolls into this high school and the, all the teachers have got presidential candidate is coming to visit us. Like it's, they don't know who's a real one and who's not a real one. The auditorium is filled with kids, you know, rubbing the sleep out of their eyes and all their teachers. Maury gets up and kind of, and, and he, he says, first he screams at him, wake up, you, you wake up, you numbness. I know, I know you didn't sleep, get enough sleep last night. I know you're not thinking about class. They're all kind of, <laughs> and he goes, he goes, all right, we're gonna have a little quiz here. He says, he says, What's the most important thing in life? And like a kid raises their hand. And this is like integrity. No, that's not it. Or or a love. No, not love. <laughs> and, he, and like they offer like three or four things that a presidential candidate might agree is the most important thing in life. And then where, whereas you guys are never going to figure it out. He reaches into his pants pocket and pulls out a wad of hundred dollar bills. And he says, "Money. This what? is the most important." Thing in life. <laughs> and the teach the teachers were like, "Oh." My <laughs> oh, what have we done? And the kids are like, yeah. <laughs> and I'm 
I have tears coming down my face. I'm laughing so hard and trying to scrib- scribble what he's what he's saying. It's like what not to tell the kids. And, and he's like a character. He's like a villain in a Batman movie. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> Except he was so lovable. And uh, <laughs> well, the, and then you moved towards that, just like you said. You just like that seems like yeah, that's going to be that's fun right, to write that's about. Exactly right. When my, when I have tears coming down my face because it's so funny, I write about it, right? You know, that, that that's exactly right. <laughs> well, that is a perfect place for us to end our conversation. We're supposed to end by 7.15 my time. So why don't we cut it off there? Your podcast, again, your new podcast, Mr. Lewis, is called? Uh, Other People's Money. And uh, and it begins uh, wherever you get your podcasts at In the beginning like of weeks. February. Early yes, February. Like yeah. Early yeah. February. Uh, lovely to chat with you as always. Yeah. Good to see you, Ira. Good to see you too. Okay. Right. Bye-bye.